Welcome everyone to Diabetes Canada's 2017 webinar series on diabetes complications. My name is Farah Ismail and I will be your host for today. We are delighted that you're able to join us today for a webinar to learn about taking care of your nervous system. <clears throat> to start off, I would like to draw your attention to our survey. It's located at the top right-hand section of your screen. In order to better serve your needs, we kindly ask that you provide us with your input by completing the short survey towards the end of our presentation, and we thank you in advance for your input. Now, throughout today's presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions, um, and this can be done simply by typing your questions into the Q&A box, which is located to the bottom right-hand section of your screen, and we'll be happy to go through them at the end of today's presentation. Also note, you're able to customize your screens. You can expand or collapse any of the webinar pauses you see fit. So feel free to do so by dragging down the bottom right-hand corner of each of the webinar pods. Our presentation today will last about 30 to 40 minutes in length, and we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. It is important to note that our presentation today is recorded and will be posted on our Diabetes Canada website at a later date. Our webinar today on diabetic neuropathy has been proudly supported by Eli Lilly Canada and Knight Therapeutics. Now I'd like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Vera Brill, and thank her for joining us today. But before turning it over to Dr. Brill, I'd like to give you a brief introduction. Dr. Vera Brill is a professor of medicine, neurology at the University of Toronto, director of neurology at University Health Network and Mount Sinai, and holds the Kremble Family Chair in Neurology. She has particular expertise in the diagnosis and management of patients with complex neuromuscular disorders. She has acted in an advisory capacity to Health Canada and the FDA. Dr. Burrell also serves as the Deputy Physician-in-Chief for Economic Affairs for the Department of Medicine at the University Health Network and Mount Sinai Hospital and the Chair of the Economics Committee. She is part of the Department of Medicine Executive Committee and helps administer this group of 300 physicians. For more information on Dr. Burrell, please read the speaker bio section and that's located to the left of your screen. So without further ado, I'd like to present to you Dr. Vera Brill. Thank you, Fira, um, for that kind introduction and for organizing this event. And I'd like to say it's a pleasure to be speaking to uh, the people who've dialed in for this. Um, what I'm going to be talking about um, are the uh, nervous system complications of diabetes, but mainly it's going to be focused on diabetic neuropathy because that is the main complication that people have to be concerned about. I'll be talking about what it is, what the risks are, how to make the diagnosis, and how to prevent or manage it as far as we can today. So I think to begin with, I'll just show the nervous system for those people in the audience who may not um, be totally familiar with our nervous systems, this funny looking man or skeleton shows the brain at the top uh, in this gray blue and then the spinal cord going down the middle. Um, and then these, these, this dense network of cables or wires running through the whole body, uh, but the arms and legs as you can see. Those are our peripheral nerves. So we are wired for messaging, just like a house is wired or any building has electrical wiring. This is like our wiring that carries messages uh, from the brain out to the body and from the body into the brain. And when uh, these um, n um, the electrical wiring or the nerves get sick, what we have is peripheral neuropathy, and you can see here the same figure, but now with the nerves far less uh, present in the legs and in the hands, and this is because the nerves have been affected by diabetic neuropathy. So we call this a glove and stocking kind of neuropathy or loss of uh, nerve function, and that's what's happening, and some, for some reason, we don't know all of the reasons. The nerves are very sensitive to high levels of blood sugar. 
or even to the pre-diabetes state before you have um, uh, diabetic neuropathy, before you have diabetes. Even in pre-diabetes, you can get nerve damage because the nerves don't like any sugars that are above the range of normal. In fact, um, for those uh, who may be interested, the leading cause of neuropathy in the world today is diabetes. Um, and that is true across the world. It used to be other things, but now this is the leading cause, diabetes and prediabetes. And when you have this loss of nerve fibers, you get this kind of sensory loss or loss of sensation or loss of feeling that can go up to the mid-thigh or even further and up high in the hands. But this is the kind of loss that you get. And what's happening is that the nerves that run through the body are getting damaged. Uh, you're losing nerve fibers, and there's some reduced blood flow, but the major problem that people have is this loss of nerve fibers that happens with high blood sugar levels. Now, what happens, what do you notice if you have this? You may not notice anything, that's one of the problems, or that people can have loss without any symptoms. But if you do notice symptoms, you can have a tingling or a prickling. Some people call it pins and needles feelings. You can notice a numbness. Uh, some people just lose sensation. They can't tell the bath water temperature with their foot or whatever. Some people feel a numbness. Others just have loss of sensation. You can have abnormal sensations that are hot or cold feelings in the feet. My feet are freezing all the time, even though it's not cold, or they're hot. And you can have pain. It can be a burning pain or a jabbing pain, uh, electrical shock-like pains. There are all sorts of symptoms. And th these are the common symptoms that you have in people with diabetic neuropathy. The other thing that can happen is that people lose their balance. They're not so steady on their feet when walking, and the unsteadiness can lead to falls. And then if you fall, you might suffer injury during the fall and have various complications from that. When the symptoms are in the feet and come up to a certain level, the hands often become involved after that. So you can have the same kind of abnormal sensations or feelings in the hands. A lot of people complain of weakness. It's not often that you notice a lot of weakness, but with long-standing neuropathy, and if it's severe, you will get weakness in the feet, in the toes, and then in the feet at the ankles and coming up. And then the other common features can be what we call autonomic problems. The autonomic nervous system are small nerve fibers that go to our internal organs and control um, a lot of our internal processes, such as our hearts, our guts, our bladder, our bowel. The most common problem uh, in the autonomic system from the peripheral neuropathy point of view is uh, early loss of uh, sexual function or erectile function in men. Um, but also you can have ongoing injury to the fibers going to the heart with difficulties that might arise uh, with arrhythmias and different heart problems. Now, the, this is a, a cartoon of what people feel. They feel a burning pain in their feet as if they're on fire, and this just goes up from the feet to the brain, and this is the kind of abnormal sensation you have uh, in some patients when the nerves are not working right. So what happens after that? You get this, the symptoms, but then uh, what happens if you were ex examined for this is that the examination would show that your sensitivity is reduced in the toes and it can come upwards. So if you put a pin on your toes, you won't feel it the same as if you put it up on your face, or if you put a um, a cool metal object on your toes, you won't feel that it's cool. Or if you uh, somebody puts a vibrating tuning fork on your foot, you won't feel the vibration as long or as uh, well as other uh, if you didn't have neuropathy. 
in very advanced cases, if you move the toe up and down, you can't tell which way it's moving, and that leads to loss of balance. If they put a light cotton wisp on your foot, you might not feel it. Or some people examine with a monofilament and check the sensitivity to that, and I'll talk about that a little more a little later. The next thing that happens is the ankle reflexes are lost. And then, too, uh, when uh, the, you're assessed when you walk up and down, when you come into the clinic and they look at how you walk, you, they'll see if you're unsteady or not, and you're assessed also for weakness, which is a late thing in this process. So this goes in a very um, linear uh, pattern from when you might get abnormal tests, but everything that you measure uh, in the examination is normal, to when you get this glove and stocking, stocking and glove, stocking and glove sensory loss to all those uh, tests I told you, and then weakness later, and then the clinical autonomic abnormalities, other than the erectile dysfunction, but the clinical autonomic uh, abnormalities due to dysfunction of internal organs usually comes late, and then other complications. This happens over years. So you may know, I told you uh, that diabetes is the leading cause of neuropathy, but beyond that, about half the people with diabetes are going to have detectable neuropathy within 10 years. In some studies, the number is higher, sometimes it's lower. It depends how many tests you have, what the sensitivity of the test may be, uh, and how much testing you have. And really, the, risk, the risks are increased with poor control of diabetes, with sugars that are too high, with A1Cs that are too high. And we know, actually, that anything over 6% in an A1C is not good for nerve. And in fact, if we look at different levels of A1C from 4 to 5 to 6%, we see that the ability to find abnormal nerve activity increases with each percentage of A1C. And so then if you go from 6 to 7 to 8 to 9, you get more and more nerve damage. We know that triglycerides, when they're abnormal and elevated, are not good for uh, the nerves. We know that being... Uh, Overweight uh, isn't good. We know that smoking and high blood pressure are all things that are not good for nerves, and these are all things that have to be addressed by the patient with their uh, health care advisors. So what are the risks? What happens if you have neuropathy? So you've lost some sensation. Maybe it's not too advanced and your balance isn't too bad. You say, well, lots of people get it. So what are the risks? Well, the risks are this. One, that the diagnosis is wrong to begin with, because even if you have neuropathy and diabetes, it does not um, save you from getting other kinds of nerve damage. So for example, if you have uh, low vitamin B12 levels, you can get nerve damage. If you drink to excess, you can get nerve damage. If you have kidney failure, you can get nerve damage. If you get cancer and require chemotherapy, you can get nerve damage. And those are separate or in addition to the nerve damage from diabetes. Uh, some of the types of nerve damage you can get have different treatments. So it's important to be sure that you're dealing with nerve damage that is just to, due to diabetes. Then if you do have that, what can happen in the feet? Well, first of all, if you can't feel your feet properly, if you can't feel a pin properly, if you can't feel other sensations properly, then you don't protect your feet properly, right? So if you put your hand on a hot plate, you yank it away because you can feel the plate. But if you can't feel it, you might leave your hand there and get burns. So for example, if someone can't feel bath water properly and they put their foot in a bathtub of very hot water, they could burn their foot. So loss of protective sensation in the feet. Or if you put a pair of shoes on and there's something in the shoe that you don't know about and you don't feel it, then you wear the shoe, you could injure the foot due to this object, whatever it could be, and it's been many things in clinics. 
like things like nails or things like baby toys or different things that can end up in a, a piece of footwear and you won't feel it so you can injure your foot. And then you injure the skin. The skin anyway is not perfectly normal. It's drier than usual because the nerves that go to the blood vessels and also the nerves that go to the skin are affected. So the skin is dry and it's not as resilient or as, or as sturdy as it should be. So, and I'm sure that everybody in the audience knows that if you injure your foot, you can get, an, or you have pressure in a, an area of your foot, you can get an ulcer, an ulcer, foot ulceration. That area can become infected. There could be gangrene and eventual amputation. And these are all the very frightening uh, risks of someone who has neuropathy. The leading cause of non-traumatic amputation, meaning amputation that is not due to uh, a car accident or injury to the foot, the leading cause is uh, diabetic neuropathy. The other risk that you have is pain. If you do get pain, it can be chronic, it can be very hard to control with medications, and it interferes with quality of life, with social activities, with your ability to work, with your ability to sleep. The pain often is worse at night when you're trying to relax. Also, the pain uh, can interfere with your ability to fall asleep or it can wake you up at night. You don't rest well, so you get tired and fatigued and uh, your mood can change. You can get very depressed about it. So the pain, uh, if you have that, can be very difficult. The other risk is unsteadiness. If your balance is poor, uh, you can fall more easily than if you had good balance. And if you fall, you could break a bone, have a fracture, uh, or injure yourself. So these are concerns with unsteadiness. And then I've mentioned already the early uh, failure of sexual function, uh, erectile function in men, and cardiac issues that can uh, lead to arrhythmias and issues with the heart. Now, how can you diagnose and screen? Unfortunately, because there's no specific medication to reverse this the way, you know, there are things you can do for kidney function, uh, you get your eyes checked because they can do laser and different things for eye pro the eye complications, uh, beyond medication for kidney function. If your kidneys fail, you can have dialysis and all, many, many things. For neuropathy, for the doctors don't always pay as much attention because there's no cure. Right now, we have no cure except what we talked about, the risk factors and controlling your blood sugar, which you're going to be advised to do anyway. So the sim maybe the clinic won't pay enough attention. So then the patient needs to pay attention to your symptoms. You need to bring them up at the clinic appointments and say, listen, I'm having this. Why do I have it? Uh, there are simple screening tests that can be done in the clinic to see if you have any nerve damage. The feet need to be checked. People go into clinics many times and nobody's ever looked at their feet. The feet need to be checked um, regularly. And then sensation, as I said, can be checked quickly with a monofilament, tuning fork, a pin, or cotton wisp. The monofilament examination uh, was tested here in Toronto, actually, by Bruce Perkins, uh, one of my collaborators and myself, in a project, wow, almost 20 years ago, but not quite. It's scary to think. And we assessed uh, using the monofilament, the 10 gram monofilament, not to look for absolute loss of sensation, but just to look at reduced uh, sensation so that if you touch the toes eight times, instead of feeling the touch eight times, people might feel it four times or five times or once or twice. And we found that could predict neuropathy. You can do this kind of screening with a pin or with a tuning fork. So you don't need to have any particular device, but you need to be tested so that people can see if you have neuropathy. Then you, we have also developed a neuropathy score where the symptoms are there or not, like foot pain, numbness, 
the tingling, the weakness, the unsteadiness, upper limb symptoms, the reflexes, and then the examination for these things give you a score that can show the presence of neuropathy. This is a little more intense and doesn't get done often because of time commitments. And then, of course, if you come to a neurologist such as myself, we're going to ask you all your symptoms, we're going to examine you, and then we're going to have nerve conductions, which are the shocks, to look at how the nerves in the legs are working to see whether you have abnormal function or normal and to check for neuropathy. Now, what can you do? What can any patient do? You have to control the sugars. It's number one because... The nerves don't like high blood sugars. I, I just, they're like, po sugars are like poison on the nerve. And for all those who, who enjoy, who, who may be in the type 2 category, I have to tell you, uh, part of it is lifestyle and uh, the diet. You really have to watch because you have to control your blood sugars to avoid further injury to the nerves. Nothing reverses nerve damage yet. Nothing that we have found really works to reverse nerve damage. And by the way, even if a patient gets a pancreatic transplant today, the nerves don't go back to normal. They just don't get worse. So you stop progression, but you don't make the nerves return to healthy nerves. And there's, this is just like if you had a stroke the nerves wouldn't come back, or if you had Parkinson's disease, we can't cure it, or if you had Alzheimer's disease, we couldn't cure it. The nerves, once they're injured and gone, they either get better or don't by themselves, and in most cases, they don't get better, but you can prevent them getting worse by controlling your sugars, and as I said, you've got to try for less than 6% A1C. You shouldn't smoke. You shouldn't drink to excess. If you've got high blood pressure, you should treat it got high lipids, you should treat them, and careful about the footwear that you put on your feet. Be careful about new shoes, tight shoes, and make sure they're empty when you put them on. Now, for pain, there are many, many different treatments that are tried. Almost none of these treatments put the pain to zero. We tend to rate the pain from zero to 10 on a scale, zero being no pain, 10 being the worst imaginable pain, and we ask people to rate the intensity of their pain so that at the next visit we can see where it is. Almost none of the treatments we have bring that pain down to zero. There are a few patients who get that, but most patients, their pain drops from a high level to a lower level that they find they can live with. And these are like anticonvulsants. So these are drugs like um, Lyrica or pregabalin and gabapentin antidepressants, and this is like duloxetine um, and uh, amitriptyline, an old type of antidepressant. Now, I've got this as second line, but maybe as third or fourth line. We use opioids, but they don't work well. People still have a lot of pain. There's dependency on the drug. The body gets tolerant. The doses have to get higher. There's the risks that people's drugs get diverted uh, within the household to other people or get stolen. And then, too, opioids typically cause constipation. And one of the chronic complaints or common complaints uh, of autonomic neuropathy is bowel dysfunction, either chronic constipation or constipation alternating with diarrhea. These are common complaints that patients with diabetes have. If you put someone with chronic constipation on an opioid, you just worsen that problem, and you may not control the pain. There are some topical things like nitrates or capsaicin pr uh, pr products, and then there's transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation that some studies have shown works nicely and some haven't. But these things are better than others because they don't have the systemic side effects all the other drugs have the potential to cause side effects like dizziness, difficulty thinking, drowsiness, and some other specific things uh, that go along with each drug. So I did talk to you about the fact that half the people will have it. You have to modify your lifestyle, exercise, lose weight, control your blood pressure, 
control your hypertension, don't smoke, don't drink too much, control those sugars, and manage your pain. And really, though, you can't stop neuropathy. Maybe if you have optimal life control, lifestyle control, you'll stop progression, but nothing really reverses it. So in we have worked, I have worked all my career on trying to find different treatments for diabetic nerve disease. And I was involved in nerve growth factor studies that failed. I was involved in multiple aldose reductase inhibitor studies that failed. I was involved in the acetyl L-carnitine studies that failed. So, you know, I've been involved in a lot of studies that aimed to lead to nerve regeneration. And it's unfortunate, but must be said, that none of them worked. And that's why we keep telling patients, you've got to control your blood sugars, control your lifestyle. And if you have symptoms of pain, we can try to help. The other symptoms we can't do much about. If you have poor balance, we might send you for physiotherapy and balance training, but we have nothing available to reverse these problems. More recently, in the last year or so, I've been working with a young PhD uh, scientist, Evan Lewis, on, he's a, a nutritionist, and the CDA, or Diabetes Canada now, f uh, funded a phase two study where we looked at uh, um, supplementation with omega-3 oils. And it, was, it is thought that there are not enough omega-3s of a specific type in the nerve, and it's not good for nerve, and that you need to take in three grams a day. So we looked at this kind of treatment in type 1 patients uh, for 12 months, and we gave them... Uh, 2.33 grams a day, and looked at changes in their nerve fibers in their corneas. One of the problems in studying this whole field is that by the time we start studying patients, sometimes we think it's too late and the nerves have reached a stage that we can't bring them back from. But uh, So we did this, and, and we look in the cornea where we think the damage is a little earlier. And we were quite amazed in this 12-month study that when we looked at people with um, uh, nerve fiber damage at the beginning and later, so you had the people at the top here who had normal corneal nerve fiber lengths that, and no neuropathy really, and it meant that they, the, they hadn't lost nerve fibers in one of the earliest places we can see it in the cornea. And they stayed well over uh, 12 months, right? With the supplementation, with no deterioration, they stayed well. And then if you looked at those who um, had reduced num um, corneal nerve fibers at the beginning, the length, but didn't have clinical neuropathy, and we found that their nerve fiber length increased by 56% after a year, which was really a dramatic change. But what was more exciting was that people who had a low uh, nerve fiber length to begin with and had neuropathy, that they had neuropathy present already, they too increased by 27% over the 12 months. This is one of the first times we've seen something that suggests that nerves might be able to recover if you, they're treated properly in patients with diabetes. Now, this is preliminary. There was no placebo group. And so it has to be studied further in a proper phase three study. But this is promising work. So there's a lot of research still going on in the field of diabetic neuropathy. One of the biggest unmet needs is how to treat it, how, how to get nerves to regenerate and recover and work normally. And this is an unmet need in, di in all forms of neuropathy, but because diabetic neuropathy is the most common neuropathy, this is one of our largest unmet needs uh, worldwide, but in, also in Canada. And this is uh, what we hope to be working on further to see if we can actually uh, get a positive result. 
And so uh, that brings me to the end of my presentation. And um, I would welcome any questions uh, from the audience. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation, Dr. Brill. Um, you've, you've provided us with some great insight around diabetic neuropathy and um, especially exciting, you know, kind of research to come as, as you've just described there in the last couple of slides. So we're definitely excited to see, you know, how, how this goes and uh, the progression of the research as well. Um, so just as Dr. Brill has mentioned, um, we will take some questions now. We've had some great ones come in. So with that, I will start with our first question here. Our participant has asked, can weight loss help to reduce the onset of diabetic neuropathy? So weight loss can't really reduce the onset of diabetic neuropathy. Um, weight loss can help reduce the onset of diabetes. Weight loss is a lifestyle modification, and if your glycemic control also improves and you don't have neuropathy, then weight loss and your glycemic control or blood sugar control should both help prevent developing neuropathy. So weight loss is very important. What I didn't mention, and it's important to know, there are studies out there now looking at people who have what is called a metabolic syndrome, you know, people who have uh, abnormal who weigh a lot, who have the weight around their stomach, who have high lipids and high blood pressure and um, what is called a metabolic syndrome. People are thinking that these patients also have early neuropathy that isn't clearly related to diabetes because they don't have diabetes. So weight loss is good for nerves, I would think, uh, and exercise that goes with it. These are all good for nerves. If you don't have neuropathy already, weight loss should help you prevent you get it. Um, it's hard to say it would delay it, but it could help prevent you get it. Uh, help, help prevent you get it. You're getting it. Sorry. Great. Thank you so much for that uh, response there. I do want to note uh, to everyone that if you do have additional questions after today's webinar, um, we'll take some more today, of course, but if you do have additional ones, please feel free to connect with us via email. So you can email your questions directly at webinars at diabetes.ca, and we'll be happy to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, so with that being said, our next question is from our next participant saying, I run. Does diabetes influence how quickly my heart rate increases when I start to run? Diabetes um, itself won't, but if you have uh, diabetic autonomic nerve impairment, so for example, if there's uh, involvement of the small nerve fibers that go to the heart, then the responsiveness of the heart can be altered, and therefore, if you're running, it yes, you can have an affection of that. And the mechanism is through the nerves that go to di um, the heart rather than the diabetes itself. So, for example, another example would be um, everybody, when you lie down and do a blood pressure and then stand up and do a blood pressure, there's a little drop, but it shouldn't be a big drop because of reflexes that maintain your blood pressure. These can be impaired in patients with diabetes and your blood pressure can drop too much. Another part of that reflex is that your heart rate from lying down to standing up should go up. When you lie down, it's lower. When you stand up, it's higher. And in some patients with diabetes, because of autonomic small, you know, these small fibers that go to the internal organs, because of this kind of nerve damage, you don't get that reflex tachycardia, that correction. So the same applies to running. It's evidence of neuropathy, really, but there is a, an influence, um, a relationship between your responsiveness in heart rate and diabetic nerve damage to the autonomic fibers that occurs in diabetes. Great. Thank you so much for that response. We've had a couple participants ask, um, you know, our next question here. So it's around how helpful are diabetic socks, and is there a recommendation, sorry, around the types of shoes um, for somebody that is experiencing symptoms of diabetic neuropathy? Yes. Yeah, so 
diabetic socks are helpful because they're um, protective for the feet and help compensate for the fact that the skin is not um, is not completely normal in the feet in, of a patient with diabetic neuropathy. Uh, footwear is incredibly important. So, for example, if you get new shoes and they're very form-fitting and they're leather and they're not, they don't give much, you should only wear them for short periods each day so that you don't develop blisters and the possibility of ulceration and infection. Uh, it's good to wear very comfortable uh, footwear uh, that uh, doesn't compress your feet too much. So both are incredibly important to maintain healthy feet in a patient with diabetes. Great. Thank you so much for that. Our next participant has asked if there are any concerns with relation to diabetic neuropathy and low blood sugars. That's a very good question as well. These are excellent questions, I have to say. Um, low blood sugars have been more of a concern in type 1 patients with brittle diabetes where you get very high swings up and down. And there's some evidence that lows, the very uh, severe lows, might be uh, harmful to the nerves. Um, so there is some evidence about that, but it's minimal. The, the concern with sugars being too low is mainly to the brain cells, because if the sugars are too low, then brain cells shut down. So that's why it's so, and that's why people get lightheaded and can lose consciousness. So that is why it's so care, important to maintain a very good blood sugar. Not too low, not too high. Perfect. Thanks for that. Um, and folks, we'll, we will take um, uh, just a couple more questions before we end off for today. Um, so Dr. Brill, our next participant, has said that they're living well with diabetes and they have yet to experience symptoms of neuropathy. They do enjoy it, having a glass of wine one to two times a week. At what point would alcohol consumption be considered a risk factor? So alcohol consumption is a risk factor in heavy drinkers. And that definition shifts a little bit from person to person. One or two glasses of wine per week wouldn't really fit that definition. Um, I think more than two, two drinks a day might be pushing the envelope. Usually when we see patients we're concerned about um, the, their ethanol alcohol intake, it's not as small as even two drinks a day. It's quite a bit, either binge drinking or many years of heavy drinking and, uh, you know, six or ten beers a day on a weekend, you know, things like that, plus drinks during the week. So it varies from person to person. Women can drink less than men and suffer earlier, so women need to drink less. Uh, but I think one or two glasses of wine uh, per week is not at the level, or even one drink per day wouldn't be at the level uh, of being injurious to nerve. Great. Thank you for that. Um, our next participant has asked that once they begin to see symptoms of diabetic neuropathy, how frequently should they go for checkups? Well, I think if someone gets symptoms, that they should go for a checkup at that point and uh, be evaluated, uh, the diagnosis made, other diagnoses excluded, you know, other factors like a B12 deficiency or abnormal proteins in the blood or other things that can cause neuropathy should be eliminated. And if it's diabetes, then their control should be brought uh, into the optimal range. And after that, Anything more than once a year would be unusual because it's very, uh, um, it's not common for patients to progress very much faster. Now, if the patient has a lot of pain and is put on medication to control the pain, then the follow up would be more frequent to see the response and also to assess whether there are any side effects from the treatment. So it depends a little bit on what the symptoms are. It depends a little bit on whether anything else is found. And it depends a little bit on whether any of these drugs to control the painful symptoms are used. 
for most patients uh, without pain, once a year would be sufficient. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, and folks, we will take our last question um, at the moment, but um, just a reminder that if you do have additional questions, feel free to email us at webinars at diabetes.ca. Um, so our last question here, Dr. Brill, what would be the one most important tip that you could provide um, to slow the progression of diabetic neuropathy? Control your blood sugars. I think in a nutshell, because the relationship between high sugars and abnormal nerve function is so prominent and so widespread today that you have to control your blood sugars. Now, that's easy to say, and it's hard to do. You know, it may, to do that, to control your sugars, you may have to modify your entire lifestyle, change your diet, change your exercise level. Uh, you know, and many other things, but that's the big thing in my mind. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, and folks, that does conclude our webinar for today. I'd sincerely like to thank Dr. Vera Brill for speaking on behalf of Diabetes Canada. It's been a great learning experience. I do want to remind everyone that today's webinar has been recorded and will be made available um, in the coming weeks on our diabetes website. So this does conclude our series, actually, on diabetes complications, um, but we do have our type 1 series beginning at the end of November, um, so please look, we do look forward to your participation in that series. So for more information on our type 1 series and to access all of our on-demand webinars, please visit diabetes.ca slash webinars. And for those of you participating today, please be sure to tell your family and friends to take the CAN risk test to assess their risk of developing type 2 diabetes. I'm not sure if you knew, but uh, if you did or did not know that one in three Canadians have diabetes or prediabetes and don't even know it. Um, so the test for type 2 diabetes can be done or found rather at diabetestest.ca. We do encourage Canadians to take control of their health and to test their health annually. And for those of you looking for more support and resources for living well with diabetes, please feel free to call our toll-free line at 1-800-BANTING. That's 1-800-226-8464. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed learning with Diabetes Canada, and we look forward to your participation in the future.